Hey guys welcome to HD Movie Recaps. Today I'm going to show you a based on true story movie called, Till. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. This woman's name is Mamie, and her son is Emmett Till, who is only 14 years old. They both go to a shopping mall in this 1955. Racism in America is still too common. Even in public places by white people. She has a mother named Alma. At home, she tells her mother that she is worried for Emmett because tomorrow he is going to Mississippi to visit his cousin. Her mother then told her to let her son go so he could get to know his family there. But Mamie is still worried because they are black people. The next morning, Emmett is getting ready to go there. She again reminded how to behave in Mississippi because there are some special rules for black people. Mamie advised him to avoid contact with white people, and she then gives Emmett the ring of his late father, who died 10 years ago on the battlefield. He was very proud to wear that ring. After getting ready, she drove him to the train station. There they met Uncle Moses and his son named Wheeler, who was also returning to Mississippi. Emmett then goes on vacation to Mississippi, leaving his mother behind. Who knows if that would be the last day for Mamie would see her beloved son alive when the train entered Mississippi territory. The black passengers were then removed and separated from the white people. Long story short, while in Mississippi, Emmett, who incidentally, is a city person and often works with his cousins and uncles in the cotton fields, then invited to relax at a shop while his cousin was playing in front. He then walked into the shop to buy candy. At that time, the cashier was a white woman named Carolyn. Their image shows a photo of a film actress in his wallet and says that she looks like a movie star. Saw Emmett contact with white people. His cousin immediately pulled him out. But before getting into the car, he instead whistled Carolyn. Until that, the atmosphere suddenly fell silent. The people immediately fled because Carolyn immediately took her gun in the car. While in Chicago, Mamie was at work. She couldn't stop thinking about her son, who had been separated from her for a week. She then goes to her boyfriend named Jean to ask him to go pick up Emmett in Mississippi. They then agreed to go in a few days. Long story short, three days later, when they were relaxing in a place Emmett's cousin named Maurice finally couldn't stand, and its indiscreet behavior. He even discussed why Emmett had whistled Carolyn in the shop yesterday because his actions could harm them. Because Mississippi is different from Chicago. In Mississippi, black people were murdered over the little trouble. Maurice plans to report into his father so that Emmett will be sent home, but Wheeler told him to keep it a secret because maybe Carolyn didn't tell anyone else either. They then went home and got ready for bed. Suddenly, in the midnight, another person banged on Uncle Moses' house. They're looking for a kid from Chicago. Who else, if not Emmett? They forced their way and then fetched Emmett. They are Carolyn's husband named Roy Bryant, and also his half-brother named J.W. Milam. Their Uncle Moses tries to get Roy to forgive Emmett because he is just a kid who still needs to learn. But Roy doesn't care about that. In the car, there was Carolyn waiting to confirm Emmett's face. And not only that, what made it sad was that there were also some black people there who worked with the Roy family. Uncle Moses and his family could do nothing. The next morning, from a distance, Wheeler sees the man who had picked up Emmett lifting something onto the pickup truck out of fear. He then immediately went into the house. That morning, Mamie also got a call. She got the news that Emmett was picked up by someone last night. Hearing that news, she then invited Jean to go to Mississippi. But Jean tells her to calm down and wait inside the house. A short time, his mother, aunt and mainly father also came to our house. Her father, named Jean, brought a man named Raphael. He was someone he used to deal with matters like this. He suggests Mamie meet William. He is a representative of NAACP National Association for the Advancement of People of Color to fight for the civil rights of black people. William also knew important people and mayors in Mississippi. The next morning, she is meet William there. He told her that at this time he was also handling two cases in Mississippi, namely the death of a priest and a man named Lamar Smith. Williams suggested taking advantage of all the press in Chicago. Mamie must have the courage to speak in front of the camera so that the news of the kidnapping is known to all the public. Long story short, finally, the news about Emmett appeared in the newspapers. Hope someone reading the paper knows of its existence. Even with William's help, this problem also reached the governor. But unfortunately, the good news was followed by bad news. There is information over the phone that Emmett's body has been found in the river. His corpse is known because he wore his father's ring. Hearing the news of her son's death, meaning immediately fainted. News of his body being found was broadcast on television. This case again became a concern related to the issue of racism against black people. How can a 14-year-old child be killed just to prove white supremacy? To Rayfield, Mamie banked to take her son's body home at any cost because she believes that William can ask the authorities to help her. She didn't want her son to be buried by the people of Mississippi. Rayfield then reminded her to get public attention to this case because it's not just about innocence but justice to all black people. And its body was finally returned to Chicago before going to the train station. Mamie talked to her mother there, 
Her mother was very sorry and blamed herself because she was the one who encouraged Emmett to go the Mississippi. Emmett's body arrives at the train station, saw a coffin being lowered there. Describe immediately took a picture. Mamie was even hysterical when she saw the crate. How could it not be? At that time, she delivered Emmett in good health. And now she's picking up Emmett with a pathetic death at the funeral home. Mamie and Jean saw the shapeless condition of Emmett's body with a bad smell and also the whole body that swells because it's too long in the water. She then checked the body of her own son. She watched carefully what happened to her son, bruises all over, and also a gunshot wound to the head. And that made her even more angry. It really means nothing to the life of a black child who was very easy to kill just because of a small problem. She then told Jean to go home to get a suit for Emmett, and she forbidden its body from being groomed. As was usual, Mamie wants the whole world to see what happened to her son. A bold decision showing her son in front of many people with such conditions outside. She tells reporters that her son came home with racial hatred. She was hit in the face, missing teeth and a gunshot wound to the head. Mamie then asked one of the journalists to take a photo of her and Emmett for the cover of the magazine's headlines. Invitations for an open funeral were eventually sent out across the country. Of course, many people did not expect that this brutal fate could befall a 14-year-old child. Hundreds of people gather at the church for Emmett's funeral. There, her aunt came. While Maurice remained in Mississippi to look after Uncle Moses, her aunt apologized and explained that she and her family had tried to save Emmett, but they could not do anything. She also decided she would move to Chicago forever because she couldn't stand living in Mississippi anymore. She actually didn't have the strength to look at Emmett, but she forced herself until she was hysterical when she saw her nephew's child. The people there mourned Emmett with the coffin open as proof that currently they are living in conditions that are not in favor of black people. Because of Manny's persistence, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam were finally charged with Emmett's murder, but she is still dissatisfied that Carolyn is still free and not a suspect. According to Rayfield, it's been a success. It's not easy being able to indict two white people in Mississippi, but in fact, in society, the open funeral that was held yesterday has its pros and cons. Some people say that Mamie really has the heart to let her son be a public spectacle. But some are also saying if she dared, because indeed the world should know the racial atrocities faced by black people even worse. A few people sent letters to Mamie with hate messages that had no sense of humanity at all. In fact, they're grateful that there's one more black person missing from the face of the earth. On that day, many parents came. They told her not to go to Mississippi due to unsafe conditions. But she said that Rayfield and William had worked out a plan so she could leave safely. She did all this for Imus. She has to appear in court to testify for the justice of her son. Her father then offered her to accompany her to Mississippi. Mamie then arrives at Mount Bayou and is escorted by William's assistant named Medgar. For safety's sake, she was taken to a house. There are a group of people working on black trial cases. They conduct investigations, search for witnesses and help victims prepare for their trials. Mentors and introduces her to everyone, including Dr. Howard, who owns this commando house. Dr. Howard was a driving force for the struggle for freedom for black people. He works as a surgeon in a hospital. He is willing to use his money to fund the struggle he wanted. After the trial, Mamie could join his organization to fight for independence for black people because, according to him, it has not been a victory. When she has indicted Roy and J.W. before, the judge's verdict is truly fair. Their struggle will be tough because they will face 12 judges who are all white. They finally appeared in court when Mamie tried to make a statement to the journalists. Unexpected disturbance occurred. I am here to see racism in Mississippi is high. Even the toilets are differentiated and not only that, only blacks were searched before entering the courtroom. Inside the room, the smell of intimidation was very strong because almost all the chairs were occupied by white people out of tens of seats. Only eight seats were reserved for black people. The rest were ordered to stand. A sheriff strider is just as bad when he tries to provoke Mamie. Moreover, the opposing team of lawyers did not greet her at all. The trial then begins. The judge sent the jurors in and, as predicted, all were white and of average age. Not to mention the opposing lawyers have asked for the trial to be adjourned because they found another witness for his trial. The judge easily agreed to the request. The trial was adjourned after the trial. Mamie asked Medgar to take her to town. She then went to Uncle Moses' house. There she was given a letter written by Emmett that he had not yet had time to send it to his mother. And also that Maurice apologizes for what happened to his cousin. Mamie then went to meet Uncle Moses by the river. Uncle Moses explained why he didn't fight back that night because in the blink of an eye when it happened, he had to choose between fighting back with his shotgun and letting the rest of his family get involved or letting it all happen. There he regretted this incident to make it sadder. He was unable to testify in court because there is no history of black people surviving after fighting white people in Mississippi. One night mentor and his friend went to a house he seeks out. We went to force him to testify in court. Wheeler tries to escape from the back door, but is caught by them. He then spoke to Howard's doctor and was persuaded to testify. Luckily, he wants to help, 
even though the stakes are the safety of his grandparents and himself. On the night of the incident, he saw Roy, JW and several black men picking up Emmett. But the people had left the city because Roy paid them. That night, Menger's wife Merle, accompanied her to speak. Merely believes in the struggle. They are doing it because she doesn't want their children to live in fear in the future. Even though her life was at stake, even though Merely was terrified every day because she was waiting for Medgar to come home. The next day the trial was held again. Finally, Uncle Moses had the courage to testify for black people. Sitting there as a gamble for their lives, Uncle Moses boldly recounted the chronology of events. How JW pulled a gun in that night. And with Roy, they kidnap Emmett. Don't know what the hearts of the people who are there are made of. Uncle Moses' testimony was even ridiculed and laughed at Lee at gunpoint. Uncle Moses also bravely stood up and pointed at JW, who was in the front seat. After that, Uncle Moses Simeon Morris immediately left for Chicago to follow there for their safety. Now it's Wheeler's turn to testify. He recounted the incident of how JW put Emmett's body in a pickup truck. But Roy's lawyer instead asked why he didn't scream for help there. He could not say anything other than to say if he certainly could. Roy's party also presented a witness, Sheriff Strider. His testimony is so absurd, he said it wasn't clear if the body was white or black when it was found. He even accused this of being the idea of a black association. Emmett must be alive somewhere, he said. Then it was time for Mamie to testify. Through questions from her lawyer, she explained that it is difficult to describe what a mother knows, but she knows that the body is Emmett's son. She has been taking care of him for 14 years. She had touched and recognized every one of Emmett's bodies. A mother's touch can easily recognize her child, even with his clothes, like recognizing his laugh in the crowd. So nothing can hide the child from his mother. Different from Roy and Jay. W's lawyers, they even lead questions outside the case. They asked about Emmett's insurance policy, which indirectly sends the jury's opinion that Mamie benefited from insurance in the event of her son death. He also suggests that Emmett may be a problem child, but she still answered the question with convincing answers. The next day, the trial begins with Carolyn's testimony, and the judge decides that this testimony will be conducted without a jury present because it's irrelevant. There, Carolyn said that at that time it was just her and Emmett in the shop while another black man was outside playing chess. She said Emmett held her hand when he asked for money. She had to stop her hand to release the grip. After that, Emmett seduced her for a date. He even came closer to her and closed her hands behind her back and harassed her. A piece of crap in that court, making it seem as if a 14-year-old boy who still watches cartoons acts like a grown man who is addicted to pornography. After that finding testimony, Mamie immediately decided to return to Chicago. And at that moment, she was unable to hear the judge's decision because she already knew what the outcome would be. And that's right, the jury finds Roy and JW not guilty of the murder, as if the trial for three days is just a formality. While in Harlem, New York, Rayfield asked her to tell her story and hundreds of people who had gathered there. In her speech, Mamie told how her son was abused and met nothing in the criminal justice system in Mississippi. As always, the black victim is to blame. She used to have a nice house in Chicago. She has a decent job, but because of Emmett's lynching, she left it all and will fight with the association to defend black people wherever they are because one of their problems is a common affair that must be fought for. Her speech managed to inspire many people. Mamie may fail in demanding justice for Emmett's murder, but her actions succeeded in creating a movement that paved the way for civil rights action in 1957. She then dedicated the rest of her life to educating children while fighting for human rights in America. Major became the leader of the movement, but eight years after that, he was murdered outside his house in front of his wife and children. Less than a year after the trial, Roy admits that they killed Emmett. In an interview for a magazine, they were paid $4,000 to confess their actions in the article. There they told how they beat him, shot him, and threw his body into the river with a fan from a cotton mill tied with barbed wire around Emmett's neck so his body would drown. But even though they admit what they did, they still spend the rest of their lives as free people. Carolyn was also never prosecuted for her involvement in the kidnapping and murder. This film is indeed dedicated to Emmett Till's memory that his struggle has become a legacy. Mamie died in 2003. In fact, the law was made to protect anyone, regardless of ethnicity, religion and race. But if the law is only in favor of a few people, then a country has not fulfilled its promise to protect all its people. And remember those who lie, hide the truth, make fun of it, and by the law, maybe they can escape the snares of the world's laws, but their lives will bear witness to their deeds on the day of judgment, and no one will be able to escape God's punishment. Thanks for watching, remain fair in all circumstances.